Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our time of worship together uh, today. This will be a briefer form of worship now as we get ourselves ready and gear up to be moving towards life groups. So a bit of information about that to come, but also looking forward to seeing each other uh, really soon. I want to start by reading from Psalm 63 from the Message Version. The psalmist says this, God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up such a hunger and thirst for God, travelling across dry and weary deserts. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. In your generous love I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains, and I bless you every time I take a breath. Loving God, we want to thank you for this day, a day where we can be reminded of your love and your grace and your glory. And may these be things that, uh, that help us come alive in you. For us, uh, as a church family, shortly we'll be moving into life groups. And it's something we've been talking about for a while. And we've been information out about that uh, for quite some time before we disappeared off on uh, some leave. Uh, in a couple of weeks, life groups will be starting again. Uh, as a good way for us to gently emerge out of lockdown. But in turn, emphasising how we uh, are functioning, uh, have always aspired to function as a church family in Limavadi. It has been our aim over the past six years to grow into a network of small groups on mission as one church, expressing through these life groups the characteristics and actions of family, um, servants, missionaries and disciples, or perhaps a better term for us today, apprentices of Jesus. As we restart these again, uh, you would have been told about the changes to their makeup and how each life group should now have the broad cross-section of age and stage of life so that your new life group finds its feet, uh, give it time and enjoy getting to know each other. When we meet as well, uh, there'll be a common framework using the acronym PRAY, P-R-A-Y, as we pause Rejoice and reflect, ask and say yes to God. So we'll kick off with us uh, gathering together, maybe enjoying refreshments that we've bought for ourselves initially due to COVID restrictions and have a catch up. Then we will simply pause. There'll be a time as we're gathered together in life group to simply remind ourselves why we are there and that Jesus is with us. We'll then move on to Rejoice with a psalm, a video from someone different from the church each week. Uh, so we get to see each other, but also have a chance to work through the psalms and rejoice and celebrate and be grateful together for who God is and what he's doing in our lives. We'll then move on to a time to reflect, uh, perhaps reflecting on the psalm, what it tells us about God, Perhaps something someone from your life group wants to share. And then, of course, you'll get me. Either on video or in person, uh, with a couple of short reflections on the Bible passage and theme, with a few questions to get discussion going. This will wrap up with us uh, with a time to ask, to pray together, or for someone to lead us in prayer. Um, in response to the teaching, and perhaps for the people and situations God has on your heart as a life group. And then comes the yes. Saying yes to God. Yielding to the stuff that maybe the Bible, uh, time around the Bible has, has, uh, has brought to bear in our lives. Perhaps as life group moves on and we're allowed to maybe eat together. This is a good chance for us to uh, share food and chew over um, having a conversation about how we can uh, put this God's word into practice, uh, the practical implications, uh, giving advice, uh, how uh, to apply this Bible to everyday life. Asking one another, what is our yes to God's call for us having met together? This will of course take a few meetups to kind of find our feet uh, to get into. Working out, for example, how to ensure the kids and young people feel fully involved, um, 
ensuring there's enough legroom for it to feel natural and informal, and keeping life group nimble enough to respond to or include the things that the life group want to be doing that day. So there's freedom within the framework, but it's a framework to, to, to get us going and it will be well resourced. Before this all kicks off, we're hopefully going to get together. Uh, all get together for a picnic and praise outdoors up at Brian and Pamela's farm. So keep an eye out on the church WhatsApp for information about this. And so we're going to worship together now as Naomi leads us in worship. Oh, shit. 
Thanks again, Naomi. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been a, an apprentice uh, or learned a new skill alongside someone. I, I used to do it. I was a, an apprentice landscape gardener for a bit, years ago now, and uh, I've got serious skill fade. Uh, but I did enjoy my job. I really enjoyed the opportunity it gave to, for me to, to watch uh, this expert uh, at work and to learn from him, um, to see how he, done, uh, how he did things, uh, and to just do what I was told. And, and the incredible thing was, is when I came alongside him and uh, watched how he did things, did what I was told, we would see gardens transformed, wastelands come to life and, uh, and be full of colour and, 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 uh, and be restored to some sense of beauty uh, because I did what I was told. Um, and in our reading today, it's a simple reminder for us as followers of Jesus that we are... Uh, apprentices of his, that we are to watch him, to work alongside him, to watch how he does things and then to do uh, the same. Our passage from Matthew uh, chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 uh, verse 28 to 30 says, walk with me and work with me, watch how I do it, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. For the next uh, wee while, um, uh, we're going to be looking at the habits of Jesus, and we're going to be doing this in our life groups. Okay, so as we move into a time where, as a church family, move into our life groups, this is what we're going to be exploring together. The habits of Jesus, often called spiritual disciplines, but I know that's a word which has negative connotations and doesn't sound quite as lifey or exciting as walking with God actually is. But we all know habits, things that fill our everyday, but these uh, being things that fill our day with an awareness and connection with God and each other. Habits such as um, scripture, silence, solitude, daily prayer, uh, study, Sabbath, simplicity, play and recreation, service and mission, care for the physical body, emotional health, family, hospitality and community. These habits were infused into Jesus' life and Jesus' disciples asked a lot of questions about them. They watched Jesus pray, and as they watched him, they then said, teach us to pray. They asked him about his parables, how many times they should forgive people, how they might provide for the needs of others with what they had. But most of the time, they simply watched Jesus' way. How he remained close to his father, the things which he did, and the things which he then taught them to do the same. The beauty of things that keep people aware that God is with them and for them. These habits of Jesus that we'll be uh, looking at together in life groups uh, act like a trellis. Um, thinking back to the gardening analogy now. And the purpose of a trellis is it's a framework for the, uh, the vine to grow on. Uh, to grow nice and straight but it's not... Uh, is the trellis is there to serve a purpose and that purpose is growth and the bearing of fruit. Uh, what's underneath every thriving vine? A trellis. A trellis that provides structure to hold up the vine so it can grow better and bear fruit. The purpose, as I said, of the trellis isn't to grow straight vines but to make the growth of fruit possible. So a set of habits to set up abiding uh, in Christ as a central pursuit of your life. Habits that organise your life around the practice of the presence of God to work and rest and play and eat and drink and hang out with your friends and run errands and catch up on the news. All out of a place of deep loving enjoyment of the Father's company, God with us. Now the hard Truth is that following Jesus is something that you do, a practice as much as a faith. At the core, the habits of Jesus are about relationship with, uh, with the God he called Father. And all relationships take time 
some deliberate thought and action. The habits of Jesus uh, are not some legalistic guilt trip, but this is an invitation. An invitation through uh, time spent in your life groups to explore the life we actually ache for. A life that can be found only by moving through the world, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. Jesus who says, um, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus carries the yoke with us, and he takes the string. He simply wants us to walk shoulder to shoulder with him. So at Life Group, we'll be exploring these habits together, encouraging one another in this way of life. I guess the question is, as we gear up for beginning, are you ready? Are you willing to arrange or perhaps rearrange your day so that Jesus' life becomes your new normal uh, seen through you? As we wrap up our service today, we're going to uh, give the opportunity now to watch the, uh, the Soma video, which some of us would have seen many times before. But it really kind of fleshes out, colours in for us what our hope is for life groups going forward as we seek to live life as a family uh, uh, of missionary servants um, on mission together as one church. Uh, let's pray. Loving God, we want to thank you for um, our church family. And as we prepare to emerge slowly from lockdown, moving into life groups very soon, we pray that as we gather around uh, the habits of Jesus, may your Holy Spirit so help us in our walk with you to put things in place in our lives that are helpful, to help us to grow in you, to grow up in Christ and to bear fruit. Come Holy Spirit and help us with what we face today. In Jesus' name, Amen. like to live like missionaries here versus thinking only missionaries go somewhere else. And that actually, that mind shift shifts people in the church significantly to start thinking, I think more appropriately about what it means to be the church, that you're always being sent. When we first started SOMA, it was just my wife and I, and um, we pulled together a group of people, that were some from past relationships that wanted to be a part of a church that lived life on mission in the everyday, not just life together on Sunday for a couple hours. Looking at what it would be to be God's people wherever we're at, Paul describes the church and he says Christ is the head of the church, which is his body in which he fills all in all, and that word body is SOMA. And so for us, this picture of what would it look like to be Jesus' body filling the city, filling every place that we're in with his presence, that's really what we saw. That, that's, that's what we believe the church to be. Every year, all of our missional communities sit down and identify who is it we believe God sent us to or what place has He sent us to and how are we going to radically reorient our lives for the sake of reaching those people. Our day-to-day, -day, our week, looks is shaped by that covenant. The goal is to see it in the, in the flow of life. Currently, our missional community is made up of you know, Clay and Christy, who are friends of ours that we got to meet through our kids going to the same school. and. Jim and Carrie Crabb, our neighbors from right around the corner. Nikki, our neighbor, a widow lady for 15 years now. Matt and Chelsea are more mature believers who've joined us, and now I'm trying to train Matt to eventually lead his own missional community. Ian and Alyssa are a couple that joined us, and in a lot of ways we're disenfranchised with the church. 
Paige and Adam will probably be starting their own mission on community in the next few months. And then of course all the slew of kids that are connected to all those people are a part of it as well. We love one another like brothers and sisters and we love those we're being sent to as though they're the lost children of God. Our Sunday gathering, that's what we call it, we call it a gathering because we really believe it's the gathering of the church. We don't believe the Sunday is the church, we believe that the people are the church and we should gather the church together regularly. And so we gather together weekly for that. Uh, our hope and our purpose in it is that we would exhort people to, to the gospel, both to believe it as well as to live their lives in light of it. We also have communion every week where we encourage people in mission communities to come together after they hear the gospel proclaimed again through the text and celebrate Jesus. I would say one of, the, one of the things that I'm really hoping for for every person in a missional community is that they could actually be the church without me. That they would get to experience what it means to be the people of God all week without necessarily needing to be at a meeting on Sunday. This is not just an act. This is your life. It's, it's radically different. They all still respected him as a teacher. They still all looked up to him. There was still a, a, a great authority even in his servanthood. He didn't when he was washing his feet, he was no less Jesus. No I began to see what Jeff was giving himself to and some of the emerging leaders. I began to notice just how much he opened his house up and how many of the other guys were giving up so much of their time. It, it wasn't just a meeting and I was, that was the other thing that frightened me. I was like, oh my God. I told Jeff when I was like, this seems like it's really gonna take your, it takes all of your life. Like this isn't just an event, but man, this is like, this has taste and flavor to when Christ first broke into my heart. This is, this is submitting my life. I remember thinking back to how I was pushing against this emphasis in missionary work and, and at that time just feeling very convicted. I was like, I'm talking to the very people that don't know Jesus. I'm going to them. I'm reaching them. I'm pursuing them. You know, very much corresponding to how God pursued me and reached out to me and chased after me there is a reorientation that needs to happen. And I also see that this reorientation is the gospel. It's, this is what belief is about. This is what, what it means to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. You could actually have a Bible study and be unfaithful to the scriptures. So oftentimes Bible studies stop. They don't actually create the church or lead to effective and healthy church. They often think that the goal was the study of the Bible instead of becoming a healthy family uh, on mission. If you don't have mission, that will be an unhealthy family eventually because there'll be no reproduction, there'll be no multiplication. Yeah, we study the Bible, yeah, we're a small group, but we believe that we should be sharing the gospel, making disciples, multiplying out and expanding to the point we, that we reach the nations. I think multiplication is at the very heart of who we are. Jesus says make disciples and then teach them to teach others as well. Healthy disciples make more disciples. Healthy leaders raise up more leaders. Healthy churches plant more churches. And if you don't have multiplication at the end of what you're supposed to do, you won't actually do what you're supposed to do. That's what I'm convinced of. Um, and most churches have settled with addition. And a lot of churches have just become orphanages. They know how to have babies, and they have a couple dads and moms for all the babies, but not nearly enough to care for them well, and they don't send them off to start new families. So it's a perpetual orphanage that they've created, and I think a church committed to multiplication will have great leaders, ultimately, because they'll have to train them up to raise their own family someday. You don't have to be a superstar to plant that kind of church. You can be a normal person. And, um, and hopefully then it builds up around normal people and you have a church made up of a bunch of normal people that have spectacular lives because of Jesus. God built it in the very fabric of creation. It says all the trees all have seed bearing fruit and the seeds are going to fall on the ground, they're going to reproduce and there's going to be another fruit bearing plant coming out of that. You know, every time that a group multiplies, there's a bit of death that happens, but it opens up space for more people to 
hear good news, to see community, and, and to be loved. And, that, and that's ultimately what's, what's important. We really think that Jesus came to die uh, to give us more than a you know, great sermon and some good music on Sunday morning. Uh, he, he died so that our whole life could be restored uh, to God. The gospel comes to bear in all parts of your life as you're, you're living in community. It looks messy and it's uncomfortable and it's scary, especially when God calls you to lead and step out and trust Him. But that's it's beautiful. We really want to be missional, you know. We really want to see people worship Jesus. It's that important, like it's, it's everything. I'm just a couple of years into this, and, and it's only a couple of years into my belief for that matter. Jeff, the way he handled it with me is he wasn't like coming in for the one-two knockdown punch. And um, when we talked about sports and just you name it, just normal guy stuff. The way I view this community now that I've become a believer and a part of a, of a group of people on mission has, has changed. You become vested in something bigger than yourself. Now I have a deeper, far deeper relationship um, with my neighborhood. There's a bond there that I think that um, never will be broken. Taking it out of the living room and getting out in your community and actually doing it. Um, and, and I love that because talk, talk gets old after a while. One particular neighbor we have, um, she's an elderly woman. She's lived in her home for, gosh, it's been 17 years since her husband passed away. She has been a recluse. You could tell she was just very lonely. This one day, my daughter's napping upstairs and I hear this knock on the door. And I came down and it was her and she was in tears. We sat out on the front porch in the porch swing and she poured her heart out to me for three hours we talked. And at the end I asked her if I could pray with her and she said that would be wonderful. This kind of began our relationship with her. God really gave me a gracious heart for her to see this is it. This is what missional living is about. It, it's not this nice, clean, tidy, wipe my hands at the end of the day and push people out and live my own separate life. It becomes part of the fabric of who you are. And now I can honestly say she feels like part of the family. Happy birthday, dear Nikki. Happy birthday to you. Woo. Woo. So we're in the backyard of a neighbor's house, uh, Nikki. And this whole back area that we're working on was completely full of blackberry bushes. Two cars were buried in the back of it. You couldn't walk through it. And the, actually the blackberry bushes were growing up half the height of the house. So what we're doing right now, this is probably the, the third, third year of us planting a garden. And our missional community is just saying, let's care for Nikki this way, but let's also care for our neighborhood because this is a great way for us to have the neighbors come together and serve with us. It's also a great way for us to start giving away the produce that we're going to be uh, seeing grow this summer. For us, when we do this kind of work externally, it's a way of showing what the kingdom of God looks like when it breaks into someone's life, that there's a process of restoration that's going on. And so that's what we're hoping for all of us, that all of us, in a sense, are going through this process of getting our lives cleaned up by the gospel. I think one of the most powerful apologetics of the gospel is when a group of people love one another, live in unity together in the midst of a broken, dark, depraved world, and they don't think that they have to remove themselves from the world to be sanctified because they believe the gospel is powerful enough to sanctify them in the middle of a broken world.
when I think about my city, not just not just this city, but all the cities. And if for some reason God's given me a heart for our country, so I think about all the cities this way. And I, I mean, I tear up often when I think about the lost in our city, and I think about the lost in our country, and I pray for them, and you know, it just breaks my heart. It's hard for me sometimes to walk through my city and think of how many people just don't understand the love that God has for them. And that grips me, and it compels me, and it motivates me. I mean, I think about my neighbors that way. And my, you know, with my kids, we pray for them, and, and it's hard. It's hard for me to, to think that they've rejected Christ, at least at this point in their life. And, uh, but I'm not gonna give up, because it's, his love is worth me doing everything so that they'll know it. My exhortation to church planters, if they don't have that kind of love for the people God's put around them, they need to ask God to give them a bigger heart. Because this isn't about them. It's not about, about their church or about their success. It's about God's glory and lost people who don't know the love of the Father.